Hi, thank you very much for joining the J Roots Global Day of Testimony. We're delighted to be sharing this across the, the globe, across the world. And uh, the idea is to be able to see and to put into the spotlight as many survivors as possible. However, one of those stories that we wanted to be able to put, to put, put forward to us today is not just about the survivor himself, but about the grandchild of the survivor and about a right amongst the nation that J Roots had a very, very deep connection with more you'll hear later on. We've been involved with uh, helping the rights amongst nations since our inception. And it's been very important for JROOTS to make sure that every group that heads off to Poland will meet one of the rights amongst nations. We've helped in general with any of their costs they may need, whether it be medical needs or rent, trying to make sure that just as we help with survivors, we're gonna help with the rights amongst nations. Today, we're very privileged to have with us the granddaughter of one of those survivors who you're going to hear about. Her name is Rachel Kastner, who has, is, excuse me, the producer of a movie called The Barn with Nancy Spielberg. Um, we're very, very grateful for you for joining us, and we're fascinated to hear, okay, your message to us today. Rachel. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much, Lee. Um, and thank you to Jay Roots um, for inviting me to speak. And thank you to everyone listening. I'm very, very honored um, to be here today speaking on Yom HaShoah and on one of, in my opinion, one of the most important Yom HaShoah um, that we will see. Um, so as to mentioned, my name is Rachel Kastner. I'm 24 years old. I am from New York, but speaking to you now from Israel, um, I moved to Tel Aviv in November after graduating from Barnard College, and I'm a filmmaker. And in addition to that, I am the proud granddaughter of three um, Holocaust survivors. So before I speak about the film and my grandfather, Carl, that Svi just mentioned, um, I'm just going to give you a little overview about what I, I want to speak to you today about. So first, I'm going to speak about growing up in the third generation and hearing Holocaust stories in my home and how I came to understand and realize the responsibility that millennials and my generation specifically has um, in remembering Holocaust stories um, and stories of our grandparents. Then I'm going to show you a little bit of the film and talk about the team, the director, Phil Berger, the producers, Matthew Hiltzik and Nancy Spielberg, who helped make the film um, and why the film was so monumental um, in my life and my family's life and how it helped me really formulate my identity as somebody that I really wanna be someone who shares and remembers and passes on the stories of the Holocaust. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about some of my thoughts about why I think this Yom HaShoah in particular is one of the most important um, and why I think it should be a wake up call for the third generation. So I'll zoom out. Um, I grew up in New York with my two brothers and my parents. Hearing the stories of my grandparents since, since I can remember. Uh, we heard about my grandparents' stories at Shabbat tables, bar and brat mitzvahs, of course, in conversations about religion and identity. My parents put a huge emphasis on our grandparents' stories um, in an effort to let us not take for granted the safety and security and privilege um, that we have living in America and being proud Jews. So I heard about my grandpa Irving who survived Auschwitz, Buchenwald, and Dachau, where he was liberated. Um, most of his family had perished. I heard about my grandma, Haiti, who was born in Romania and survived by hiding in a liquidated ghetto, in, a, in an already empty ghetto with her grandmother, um, scavenging for food and, and remaining completely alone. Um, and I heard about my grandpa, Carl, who was saved by Paulina, a righteous Gentile, and her parents, who helped hide them underneath a barn for 18 months, where my grandfather didn't shower, didn't see the sun, didn't move. They were packed like sardines, is the, the phrase that he would use, telling us the story growing up. Um, and there were, there were 18 Jews in that, barn, in that bunker underneath the barn. So I grew up hearing these stories often, um, 
but perhaps not fully understanding why I was hearing them so often and why it was so important to really listen when I was hearing them. Um, I think this is partially due to the fact that I grew up in a mostly Jewish and Ashkenazi community where I had many friends whose grandparents were also survivors. And I didn't understand how, really how unique it was to have grandparents who were survivors. Um, but that being said, I, I loved storytelling. And I was always an actor. I started producing films in the house at 14, and I loved sharing stories, writing scripts, writing them down. Storytelling powered everything I did, where I went to camp, what I wanted to do during the summers, what I did after school. Um, but I never thought that it would in any way interact with my family story and the, the legacy of my grandparents as survivors. And that was until I was 17 and went on one of the trips um, that Jay Roots organizes with my high school class. And I went to Poland and I walked in Auschwitz and saw where my, many of my family members had perished. And we, were, we went to Warsaw and that is where we met with Paulina. And Paulina is the righteous Gentile who saved my grandpa and his parents. And she was a remarkable, remarkable woman who I had the fortune of meeting on my 18th birthday there with, with my high school class. And it was a very, very, very remarkable moment meeting somebody who's directly responsible for my being here speaking with you today. And Paulina looked at me and the first thing she said was, I love you in English. And I, I hadn't expected her to, to know any English. She had a translator, Monica, who was lovely. Um, and I learned that day that Paulina didn't have any children of her own. Um, and she thought, she said she thought of me like a granddaughter and she had a grandmotherly vibe um, to her. And it was a very, very special day that we had together there. And when I left and went home, I kept thinking about the fact that she didn't have anyone who was going to continue telling her story. She didn't have any children to pass down the story of, of what she did, um, which was so remarkable. And immediately I felt this sense of responsibility and urgency to write down the story. And I thought, listen, I have all, I have all of the tools and all of the passion for storytelling. How could I not tell this story? Um, and I also realized how, you, how special it was that my grandparents did have children and grandchildren to tell their story to and how, how important it was to start listening, really listening. So over the next, it took four years, um, but with the team that I mentioned before, um, we raised the money and brought my grandpa Carl back to Poland to meet Paulina for the first time in decades. And we filmed an entire movie about him going back and meeting her and going to find his hometown and looking for the barn that he was hidden in. And being in the room with the two of them was very, very special. And I'm going to take a break to just show you the trailer and then we'll come back to talk. So this is the trailer of the barn. What's your earliest memory? What's the first thing that you remember if you go back all the way in your head? This is the street where your family lived before the war. Does any of this look familiar to you? I was born in 1934, southeast Poland, near the Carpathian Mountains. We knew something was wrong. That's right, but they didn't ask. Then we hear roar of motorcycles. I want you to think about coming back with me. I'll be looking at the people on the street with their parents help to kill us. My name is Carl Shapiro. I'm coming here because uh, I want to find out Something that happened about my past. My father and my mother walked four or five nights. Looks like nobody's been here in 50 years. Another memory that went down the drain. I opened up the clump of hay and I let myself down into the hiding place. Next time we get off this train, we're going to be in Ukraine. I don't want to bring hatred into my life. I don't want it to surface. We're not killers, but if someone wants to kill us, we'll kill them. Period. There's that one. There's a fear. Fear that if they hear any noise, they come and they discover you. Not only you'll be killed, but all of us will be killed. 
Paulina! <laughs> you can't talk to your wife, to your children. You can't understand it. Carl, this is the bar. So that is um, the barn um, trailer, and I'm very glad to show it to you. Um, so when, when we got back, we worked on the film for, for four years, as I mentioned, and last year it premiered at the Miami International Jewish Film Festival, and then went to several other festivals. And in addition to that, and perhaps more meaningfully, I've had the chance to bring the film to several schools, um, on Yom HaShoah and on other days, and hear kids and speak with kids and high schoolers and see their faces as they watch this film. And we all know that movies can inspire and can change us and can be powerful. Um, even more so films that are, that are based on true stories such as this. So one, one takeaway that I had, um, while making the barn, while producing the barn, is that every story, every survivor story is worthy of a movie. Um, I mean, just to survive, to survive the Holocaust means that several, several miracles had to go right. Um, and every Holocaust survivor that I've spoken with, I've thought to myself, this, this would make a great, this would make a great story. This is a great story. This needs to be told and shared. Um, and I'm very glad that I was able to save this specific story because to a year and a half ago, Paulina passed away. And because we were able to get her on film and meet with her again and bring Grandpa Carl back to speak with her, we saved that history. And although firsthand in-person testimonies are, are remarkable and the most touching, this is perhaps the next best thing. Um, to have people on film, to have younger people telling the stories of their elders, telling the stories of their grandparents. And the visual medium is really important. Obviously, I believe in it. And this is what I want to do for my career. But I, I know that films can inspire people. And if we can share and save and record the stories of survivors, we can make, we can bring them with us into the future. So since the premiere of The Barn, I've become much more attuned um, to survivor stories, and I've, I've interviewed and recorded testimonies of many other survivors. Um, I'm working on my next project, um, which tells the story of survivors who went to the U.S. as refugees and then served in the Army, as my other grandfather did. Um, and I spent a lot of time talking to parents, friends, grandparents and recording their stories and encouraging them to talk to their grandparents. Because when I think about the world without survivors, I want to cry. It has been such a big part of my life since before I can remember, I've always heard the stories and always been speaking to survivors. And I remember in high, in elementary school and in high school, having survivors there on Yom HaShoah telling their stories. And every year it was less and less and fewer and fewer survivors coming in. And as a child, I didn't understand what that meant, but now as an adult and as a storyteller, I understand that it means that the stories are on the brink of disappearing. So now I'm gonna to move to some of my thoughts on why I think this Yom HaShoah in particular um, is extremely important. So two of my grandparents, as I mentioned, Haiti and Carl, both spent the majority of the Holocaust in isolation. Um, looking for, fearing for lack of food, fearing of loneliness, of depression, of course, the existential threat of fearing, their, fearing for their lives. And now they are again in isolation. I know that many of us have family members, who, especially survivors who are alone, who did their Pesach seders alone, who are alone in their apartments. And I know that my grandparents have expressed to me and to my family members that they are feeling similar they're, they're, this is bringing up feelings from their childhood when they were in isolation. And that is very, very hard to hear. Um, and very sad when I think about it. Very, I get very sad. But on the other hand, this, this time that we're all at home due to COVID has given me more time than ever to speak to my grandparents on the phone, to FaceTime them, to email them, to write down things that they said, to engage in conversation with them and to relate to them. Um, and I've been, I've been making a conscious effort to really do that um, because 
right now at this unique time, we are losing so many survivors that we didn't anticipate to lose so early. Um, and those, each one of those has a precious story that could, could be a movie um, and is worthy of being written down and recorded and shared. So I think that this Yom HaShoah is particularly important. And, and I hope that if I can leave you with anything, it is that this is the time not to be embarrassed and to make a phone call, to call a grandparent, to call a friend's grandparent. We're all at home and all we want to do is talk and relate and share stories. I had a friend call me this morning. Um, we speak around every Yom HaShoah. She's very connected and she calls me and she asked, what, what do you think I should be doing tomorrow? Um, how can I commemorate this day in a special way, even though I can't go meet people in person? And she and I spoke and she's going to be calling one of her high school teachers to hear about their parents' stories. She's calling her grandmother and finally recording her grandparent, her grandparent's story, which is amazing. You might've heard it six times, listen to it again and write it down, record it. It's even better if you can get it in their own voice. So I'm going to show you one more part from the barn um, and then I will turn it back over to Jay Roots um, to wrap up. But it has been very, very special to share my grandparents' story with you and I hope that, I hope that even one of you will be inspired to call someone from your shul, from your neighborhood, a friend's grandparent, write down their story. The third generation is the key to Holocaust memory and we have a huge responsibility on our shoulders, but we also have the opportunity to fulfill that responsibility right now. So with that, I'm gonna show you one more clip and thank you so much um, for listening. It's a little bit taller than I thought. Watch your head. Rachel, don't come down. You don't need this experience. Rachel, don't go in deeper. There's no need for you to become claustrophobic and to How did you do this for a year and a half? Rick, there's no way if you don't understand. If your life is in mortal danger, you do anything. If you have to do it, you do it, okay? Please make closure with us and try to, and enjoy life that I didn't get a chance to do. Oh, you want to undergo torture just to feel to know how it feels? It's enough that uh, my parents and I did it. Please, uh, I'm getting now very angry and upset. Okay, okay. Let's get out of here. My grandfather's anger. So with that, I will pass it back to Jared. Thank you so much for joining me and listening to my family story. Um, it's been very special to share with you. Hi, thank you very much, Rachel, for your... Uh, uh, amazing insight into the story of your grandparents and to Imek in particular. Now, most of the time when we're presenting during the day and the survivor story during today's Global Day of Testimony, people, although everyone's at home, don't have sort of babies, babies on their knee. But this, this, this baby in particular is special for the, uh, for the story. Um, as I've been spent many times listening to Paulina's story uh, when we've been lucky enough to be in Poland with her, um, she was a lady who really, as you said, left an impression, an amazing, amazing impression. Um, and she had a sense of holiness to her, uh, an, an ability to really um, sort of encapsulate what it is to be someone who cared about human life. Even those who said she only ever spoke through a translator, um, she always answered the question of like, why did you do it? Why did you risk your life? You didn't need to speak Polish. She answered with her eyes. Um, and it turned out she was saying it was obvious. It was like a basic necessity for her. Um, and um, she was someone that you wanted to be close to and wanted to take some of that goodness. Now, when she, um, when she passed away, I think for, for me personally, it was very much a, um, 
a, a reminder of how delicate memory is, because although every time, and I was lucky enough to hear how many times, I would always think, need to remember these stories, need to remember these stories. Once someone does pass away, you ask yourself, how do you, how do you really remember? Um, and in the same way as, uh, as you said, for me, it was a big shock to know that she, she had no children. The, the depth of her tragedy was that not only was, did she risk her life, but her husband was a Polish non-Jewish Auschwitz survivor. And because of what he'd suffered, they weren't able to have children. There was no one to carry on their, their name on their, or their legacy. Um, and as you said, a year and a half ago, Paulina passed away. Um, this little baby um, is uh, almost a year old. Um, this is Halel Neshama Paulina. Um, she's probably the only Paulina at a nursery school in Israel. Um, and when we, when she was born, when we wanted to say that, how do you, how, how do you remember someone? How do you in, inculcate these these values into into family, into in, in, into life? Um, and it's a a question that I think will accompany her throughout her life. When people say, sort of living here in Israel, why why on earth do you have a a Polish Catholic name um, tagged on? Um, and it will cause people to ask and cause people to say, were there really such people? Uh, really people who saved other people's lives at the risk of everything. So um, sort of re this is the first time that Halona Shema Paulina has met one of the uh, the other sort of grandchildren of Paulina. She's, she has learned to wave with a little bit of help from her sister. Um, so it, it, it's very special for us to know that that investment in, in, in life and that dedication, for both from the survivors and those who assisted, those who helped, um, is a, a value that we want to talk about uh, today on Yom show in particular. So I really want to thank Rachel uh, for her presentation today, for spending the time with us on the Global Day of Testimony. Uh, we all look forward to being able to see the, the film at film festivals uh, near us and even, even wider, and we look forward to be able to share that. Um, thank you to everyone who's been watching today. Um, there's lots more content for the whole of the J Roots Global Day of Testimony. Just follow J Roots on Facebook and YouTube, and we uh, look forward to uh, being able to share some of these amazing stories with you again. So thank you very much.